at the stress urinary incontinence. So Dr. Devang Sharma will be your speaker tonight. He works at the Germantown branch of Chesapeake Urology. Um, Dr. Sharma did both his residency, urologic residency and fellowship uh, at University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Uh, that's one of the leading andrology fellowships in the country. And while he was there, he specialized in um, sexual medicine, incontinence, and fertility. So he's going to talk about a number of different treatment options tonight for stress incontinence, as well as the causes and um, kind of the stuff that he gets to at the end, the implantables and whatnot. There's only a, there's not very many doctors who specialize in prosthetic urology in the United States. So he is one of the experts uh, in this field of study. So I just wanted you to know, and this is Dr. Sharma. Go ahead and get going. Thanks, James. I appreciate it. And of course, thanks to Boston Scientific for helping organizing and Chesapeake Urology. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I am gonna share my screen with you guys because there are some slides that we put together to help get through the topic. So we're gonna be talking about incontinence or urinary leakage after prostate treatment. So to encourage open dialogue with the participants and just for privacy purposes, we ask that you don't use any type of audio or video recordings while we're uh, going through the presentation. James already gave a little introduction to myself. I'm, I'm working out of the Germantown office right now, and we're gonna jump right in and talk a little bit about male stress urinary incontinence and starting off with what that means, who has it, what causes it. So the specific type of incontinence we're talking about is called stress urinary incontinence. So leakage that's involuntary, urine that comes out of the bladder under some type of stress. And that happens because of some inherent weakness, injury, or malfunction of your natural plumbing that is supposed to keep you dry. And that ultimately leads to leakage of urine that can happen during laughing, heavy lifting, something as low key as walking, bending, or you know, more rigorous activity, pushing, pulling maneuvers. This is probably more common than people realize because it can be an embarrassing problem and not a lot of men share what they're going through. Studies have shown that as many as 50% of men report leakage immediately after surgery for prostate cancer. Luckily, many of those men heal and regain their urinary control within the first few weeks or months after their surgery but somewhere between 10 and 15% of men will have some persistent amount of leakage that lasts well beyond the first year after surgery. 10 to 15%, that ends up being a lot of men. We're talking about something along the line of half a million men who suffer from this type of urinary leakage around the world. I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this slide because I think it's really helpful to understand how our bodies work normally and how that can change after prostate treatment, whether it be for cancer, whether it be for just benign enlargement of the prostate, or whether it be after some type of reconstruction from some type of pelvic injury. So we're looking here at a man standing and basically he's cut in half right down the middle. You see the bladder right underneath, you see the pink round prostate, a little shelf of muscle, which is called the sphincter. When you're trying not to pee or when you're writing your name in the snow and trying to control it, that's the muscle that you squeeze to help keep the urine inside. If you keep following down the diagram here, you can see the back of the urethra, that's the tube that the urine passes through, all the way to the tip of the penis. So under normal conditions, the bladder has a pretty simple job, and that's just to sit there and hold urine and do nothing through most of the day. When you're standing or sitting at the toilet, it should squeeze, a good hard squeeze, to empty your bladder completely. Now the prostate, or the bladder neck, where the bladder connects to the prostate, is the first line of defense to keeping men dry. You know, men and women experience things like overactive bladder in exactly the same way. But there's a reason why women have more problems with leakage than men. It's 
because the prostate helps keep us dry when there are abnormalities related to the bladder. The next line of defense, and that's the one that we actually have control over, is the sphincter. So there's really two levels that allow men to stay dry on a regular basis. Now, what happens during surgery is the bladder neck, the prostate, it's either removed completely or it's disrupted during the course of surgery. That can even affect the sphincter depending on how aggressive somebody's cancer was, depending on what type of injury somebody had, whether or not they had radiation to treat their prostate. So it's really, you know, let me know if you can see the arrow here, but we're really talking about this area of the connection between the bladder and the prostate, the prostate itself, and then this shelf of muscle that wraps around this tube and helps voluntary control of urine. So stress incontinence, which is the laughing, coughing, sneezing type of leakage, that again, it happens in about 10 to 15% of men after removal of the prostate for prostate cancer. But that's not the only situation in which men can have these problems. There are certain neurological disorders that can lead to stress urinary incontinence. There are a number of surgeries that are done for totally benign, non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate. And, and men can have issues with leakage after that type of surgery. There's so many new techniques. You know, people are doing robotic, partial removals of the prostate for benign enlargement. There is something called a homium laser enucleation, which is basically doing an entire prostate removal through a camera endoscopically. And sometimes those things can lead to leakage. And up to 3% of men after that type of surgery can have stress in their incontinence. It's less common in radiation, but men who have had radiation, especially after removal of their prostate, can have issues with this type of leakage. And then finally, this is the case for a lot of younger men, a lot of you know, soldiers, a lot of people who have had crush injuries, pelvic trauma that causes injury or disruption, basically the urethra popping off from the prostate can have this type of leakage after reconstruction. So if you're in that situation and you're having this type of leakage, chances are a lot of the men who have tuned in to hear this talk tonight have, I don't have to belabor this point, okay? Nobody ever died of their urinary leakage, but it has tremendous, tremendous impact on quality of life. And, and, and that can be any number of things, and you see that on this slide here. And one of the most prominent is social functioning. It can be hard to just go about and do things that you normally took for granted. You know, going out to a movie and knowing that you're not gonna leave a mess you know, by the end of it, or need to get up and, and get out of your seat multiple times, being able to use a public swimming pool, you know, being able to have the confidence that, you know, when, when your puppy jumps on your lap, or, you know, you have a, a grandchild sitting on your, on your knee, that it's not going to lead to a mess. And, and those types of things can really affect just the normal day-to-day -day life in men. And, it can, and that can play a, a psychological toll. There are studies that prove men who have urinary incontinence have higher rates of depression, are more likely to have severe psychological distress from this. And you know, that can lead to emotional disturbances and even relationship issues. Part of what I do is I'm an expert in sexual medicine and reconstruction it's so hard to talk to guys about improving their sex life and improving their performance in the bedroom when you know keeping dry is an issue. So let's go on to, to look a little bit more about how prostate treatment actually affects that machinery that we were looking at earlier. So somewhere just south of 200,000 men are diagnosed with prostate cancer every year in the United States alone. About 70,000 are gonna go on to have complete removals of the prostate to treat the prostate cancer every year. Now the radical prostatectomy 
is an operation that not only removes the prostate, but it has to remove some of the tissue around it. There is some collateral damage that happens with these surgeries. The one that's talked about the most is the nerve damage that can lead to erectile dysfunction after surgery. But what's talked about a little bit less is the collateral damage that can happen to the sphincter and to the bladder. And if you look at the diagram here, on the top, you see the anatomy the way it is before any type of treatment. Now, in the unfortunate cases when there's a cancer growing inside the prostate and the prostate has to be removed, you can see the junction here between the prostate and the bladder. There's only one way to get it out. This is a continuous tube, and we have to take that middle section out and put the two ends back together. Now, when that's done, we talked about in one of the first slides, men have two lines of defense from leakage. And the first one are the muscles of that bladder neck and the prostate itself, gone, not coming back. There's no way to grow back. You don't want to grow back a prostate after prostate cancer surgery. So your first line of defense from leakage is completely gone, okay? In, in most surgeries, the sphincter itself, which is that muscle that you have voluntary control of where you can go, hmm, and stop the stream of the urine, that can be preserved and that's intact. And that's something that's there when we make that connection again. This is why we encourage men to do exercises before surgery. Start exercises about a month after surgery when your surgeon is, is ready for you to do so. Because what you're doing is you're getting that muscle big, you're getting that muscle strong and, and more useful than it was before. Before, chances are your prostate was doing all the work to keep you dry. Now that that is gone, you need to use that urinary sphincter to bulk up, build that muscle, and help keep you dry. But that's hard to do. In some men, that's impossible. And again, that's why 10 to 15% of men after this surgery are gonna have persistent issues with leakage, regardless of how good you are with your exercises regardless of how good your surgeon was, okay? This is just an unfortunate part of being a prostate cancer survivor. So again, incontinence after surgery, right after surgery, that's normal. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about leakage that lasts beyond that first six, nine, 12 months, okay? And, and if it's still there at that point, there's not a whole lot of changes that are gonna happen then. You know, maybe some small per short percentage of men are gonna improve up to two years out from their surgery, but that's when we really have to start thinking about our treatment options, okay? And, and, and you know, we're gonna talk about treatment here. Leakage after prostate cancer surgery is the most common form of stress incontinence in men, but again, that's not the only thing. So, so my guys who are suffering with leakage, because of a BPH procedure, a laser procedure, some type of injury, again, spinal cord injury patients, whatever it might be, if you have stress urinary incontinence, this is very treatable, okay? You just have to find the right provider. Now, urologists are surgical specialists who specialize in the diseases of the male and female urinary system and reproductive organs. There is something called a prosthetic urologist who has additional training, usually fellowship training, in men's health and urinary incontinence. And, and that type of urologist can help figure out if you're a candidate for something like a male sling or an artificial urinary sphincter. Before we go into surgery, I want to spend some time and talk about things that everyone can do, you know, without seeing a urologist, without signing up for surgery, that can help manage some of this leakage, okay? And it's split up into three categories. There are behavioral modifications, interventions, and then just coping strategies. So under behavioral modifications, if you're drinking like four Nalgene's of water or just like, you know, you have a cup of juice or, or a bottle of wine there with you for, for most of the day, it's gonna be an uphill battle. Okay, when you're dealing with a lot of urine volume, you're making more work for that poor sphincter that's left over 
trying to keep you dry, okay? One thing that a lot of men do, I call this bathroom mappers. If you know where the bathroom is on every floor of your office building, on every floor of your doctor's office, you know, if you use the bathroom before you go somewhere and as soon as you get somewhere, you are a bathroom mapper, okay? That is a behavioral modification that you're doing without even realizing it. That is, to a certain degree, helping keep you dry, okay? Or at least trying to keep you drier. Now, for interventions, pelvic floor physical therapy can play a huge role. This is something that men can learn to do before prostate cancer surgery. And this is something men can do afterwards when they realize they're having an issue with stress urinary incontinence. A lot of guys are familiar with this. These are the Kegel exercises. So this is like squeeze and hold it for 10 seconds at a time. This is, you know, squeeze as many times as you can for 10 seconds, repeat that and have an exercise regimen that you do on a regular basis. Now, I know how this works. Hard to remember, hard to do, but this is one of those things where you, the more you put into it, the more you're gonna get out of it, okay? And the whole point here is you had two lines of defense, one of those was injured, and you're trying to bulk up the other one, the, the sphincter that you still have some control over to try to get the continence back, okay? Biofeedback is a specialized technique that some physical therapists can do. This is basically stickers that you can put on in the genital area. And that will show you on a screen. This is kind of like an EKG for your muscles down there. Because, you know, this is not something that most guys are familiar with, they know about, like, oh, am I squeezing the right thing? No, you're squeezing your, your butt muscle or your, your ab muscle or your back muscle. You're supposed to squeeze the muscles in between all of those things. So biofeedback can tell you because it shows you like a little EKG squiggle. And if you're squeezing it, it goes, you know, very active, and if you're not, it's very still. And that's something that physical therapists, pelvic floor physical therapists can use to help you learn how to build those muscles. Now, that doesn't work for everybody, okay? You could be the best student and of all of the, you know, pelvic floor therapists in, in the area, and, and sometimes it's just, it's not enough, okay? So then there are coping mechanisms. There are pads or liners, there are diapers or depends, okay? Most men are familiar with those. They come in different shapes and sizes. You know, the, the marketing for these are, are getting better and better. You can see celebrities on, on, on some of these um, absorptive underwears, and they're available everywhere, okay? The, the catheters, some people are a little bit less familiar with. So look at this diagram in the bottom right corner. This is not a catheter that goes inside the penis and into the bladder. This is an external urinary collection device or condom catheter, okay? This is basically a plastic condom that slips over the penis and it has tubing. So laughing, coughing, sneezing, no problem. It's not gonna go into the underwear, it's gonna go into this urinary collection device, okay? That's an option for some guys, but these things are a pain to fit, to size, to stay on, okay? You know, wh what do you do when you need to change your clothes? What do you do when it's sliding off and you're out somewhere, okay? So this is one strategy, but it doesn't, it doesn't work for everybody. Now, penile clamps, I don't know if, you know, you guys know about penile clamps. That's here on this diagram also. You see this little almost alligator looking thing with, blue foam on the inside and plastic on the outside. This, believe it or not, it looks simple. It works for some guys. If you just, you need a little bit of time to stay dry enough to sit in the movie theater or something like that, this can be placed over the penis just like that. And that clamp can be enough to maybe not make you bone dry, but socially dry enough to do some of the things that you need to do. But again, these are all coping mechanisms. These are not actually treatments or cures for the problem, okay? And, and these all have certain drawbacks. If you're, if you're a guy who's in this situation, again, I don't have to belabor this point. These things are expensive, 
Like look at the five-year costs of pads and diapers. Say you're using five pads a day, okay, conservatively. I've got plenty of guys who use more than that. You do that for five years, we're talking about seven grand plus. And that's if you're doing a good job buying these things in bulk at like Costco or Sam's Club or something like that. You know, there are hidden expenses in these things. It's not just, you know, sure, you're going through all these pads. These things are contributing to, to pounds and pounds of garbage. These are more and more trips, you know, to go buy them. Oh, hey, am I running out? Do I need to go get more? And it, there's just, there's a lot that goes into this that's inconvenient, right? These things can be bulky. They can leak. There can be smell depending on how frequently you're changing them. So they're, they're not perfect and, and they can be costly over time. The catheters we talked about a little, okay? You know, it can be a little bit uncomfortable. It, it might not be a great long-term solution. If you're not good about changing those things, you can run into infections, okay? And the clamp, again, not for everybody. You know, the clamp is something that most guys use as a, hey, I got to do something, let me use this, not I have a clamp on my penis all the time, okay? Because that can lead to damage, scar tissue, discomfort, you know, skin erosions. It, it, it's just, it's a coping mechanism. It's a short-term fix, all right? And there are clever things. I've seen guys like MacGyver, a bunch of different equipment or things to help keep them dry. A depend with a liner, with paper towels, with a clamp, like some levels of barriers just to get out and, and get back to routine or regular there's a better way than just figuring it out on your own, okay? And we're gonna talk about a couple of the products that may be a fit for you, for somebody you know. The male sling is one of them, the artificial urinary sphincter is the other, okay? And they work in very, very different ways. But these are both inherently designed to address the problem and try to fix it, not just deal with it, manage it, or cope with it, okay? The sling, and we'll go in, we'll, we'll go more into these, okay? But this is this is big picture view. The sling is a support, okay? It's a support for the urethra. It's kind of like a little hammock. Instead of just being a wide open channel, remember we had the prostate, sorry, we had the bladder, we had the prostate in between, and we had the urethra. Instead of just being big bladder connected to that urethra, this hammock helps give you a little bit of support helps kind of recreate that first line of defense so your poor urethra is not, or your poor sphincter is not trying to do all the work. Now, studies have shown that this can be pretty effective, but this only works for guys who have mild, mild leakage. We're not talking about pads and pads a day, okay? It's a soft mesh material. This is the same type of material that's used for hernia repairs and other types of surgery, okay? So this is not some weird new thing. This has been used for years and years and years as part of surgery. And, and now it's being used effectively to help treat men who have leakage. Now the artificial urinary sphincter is different. So it, it, it doesn't just prop things up to try to get you a little bit drier. This is designed to recreate another sphincter, one that works reliably and one that can get you closer to the, to the goals and the dryness that you're looking for. This is something that can be used to treat all levels of incontinence, okay? So the sling is great for guys who have mild leakage, but the sphincter, it doesn't matter how much you leak, it really doesn't. That, that makes no impact on whether or not you're a good candidate to get a sphincter. The sphincter is a little bit more complicated, okay? The sling, you put it in and, and it's doing its job. The sphincter, you have to interact with it. Okay, this has a cuff, this has a pump, this has a balloon, and, and we're gonna go in and show you pictures on that. So let's finish talking about the sling first. This particular sling, the advanced male sling, it has 10 plus years of clinical use, meaning that we've been putting this in guys for over 10 years now. And the studies have shown that this is best for guys with a mild amount of leakage. So everybody, every prosthetic urologist has a different way of assessing leakage. I typically have guys come and see me with a relatively full bladder. You don't have to work too hard and, and stress out about it, but you come and you see me with a relatively full bladder. And I say, all right, stand up, pants and underwear down. 
give me a couple coughs and, and I'm ready. I have an absorptive pad there right in front of me, but cough one, cough two, cough three. Okay. If we're talking about drops, not a stream, you're a good candidate for a sling, or you may be a good candidate for a sling. Again, this, this is, some people call it a hammock. I kind of think of it as like an internal or an implantable jock strap almost, because most guys, you know, know what I'm, know what I'm talking about there. You have to slide your legs into it and kind of fit it just right and, and, and pull it up to make sure it's doing its job. Well, that's basically what I do in the operating room. I have to get back there to put this little mesh underneath and slip it in basically between your inner thighs to fit it perfectly for your anatomy, okay? This, when it works, people are really happy because again, you put it in, you don't have to do anything. And, and as soon as you're done with surgery, it's working. There's no, there's no lag time, there's no downtime. So that leads to a pretty high satisfaction rate in a well-selected patient, okay? Most guys want this, not all guys can get this because of the amount of leakage. So obviously, the, it, it's minimally invasive. We're talking about outpatient surgery. You're not in the hospital, okay? You're not going home on prescription pain pills. You're alternating over the counters. You're getting a you know, bag of frozen peas between your legs and, and some supportive underwear, and you're good to go. You're going back to regular activity within a week or two, believe it or not, okay? And again, the big advantage of this is I put it in, you do nothing, okay? It's just, it's working after that. And this can help guys feel more normal, right? More confident that you can go about doing your normal things. But the catch is it doesn't really apply to a lot of guys, okay? It doesn't apply to most guys, to be perfectly honest. This is the surgery for stress urinary incontinence. I can't emphasize this enough. This artificial urinary sphincter, the AMS 800 urinary control system, if you're a man with stress urinary incontinence, Yes, there's a sling. Yes, there are depends. Yes, there are catheters, clamps, whatever. Pelvic therapy, great. If you still need something, this is the surgery. That's what a gold standard is. This is what most guys need and most guys would benefit the most from, okay? 40 years of use, doesn't matter what type of incontinence. Let's look at the parts, okay? The part that does the work is the cuff. So look on this diagram, look in the middle at the yellow little balloon that's labeled cuff. That fits around the urethra, okay? Just like that clamp was holding things from the outside, this is a cuff that's implanted on the inside and it's a balloon. So it's filled with fluid that is keeping that urethra closed and keeping the urine from leaking out. When it's time to go to the bathroom and empty the bladder, that's where the control pump comes in. So look on the diagram, go down and look to the testicles. There's a yellow control pump. The man reaches down, gives it a couple squeezes. This is a nice, soft, very well-designed pump. We put it in a spot that's easy to access, easy to feel, give it a couple pumps. Next step, look at the white balloon, the top of the image all the way on the right, hiding behind the pubic bone and sitting next to the bladder. That's the pressure regulating balloon, okay? That's one of the most clever parts of this device. That balloon holds the right amount of pressure, and when you pump up the device, fluid is going to leave the cuff, go into that little white balloon, allow the urethra to open up and the urine to pass, okay? That's it, you don't have to do anything else after that. It inflates back and, and it's shut and it's keeping you dry in between voids. So let's look at a video. Again, it's, it's not very complicated. This is gonna show you the exact same thing that I just showed you. This is a man, this is his genitals. Put your x-ray glasses on. You find out that he has a urinary sphincter. You didn't know that from the outside because it looked the same. You reach down, give it a couple pumps, urine is out, that's it. That's the whole video. There's not much more to it. You can see here, it's, it's filling up and it's inflating by itself. So that's all it is. It's a couple pumps when you need to go to the bathroom and, and it takes care of the rest, okay?
men are very, very happy with this. Okay. Like you know, satisfaction rates are satisfaction rates. Everybody's experience is a little bit different. People are pretty happy with the surgery. Okay. And, and it's because it can make such a dramatic difference. It can, it can be, you know, the difference between standing up and just completely getting everything wet to being dry. Okay. And, and that's not the experience for everybody. Bone dry may not be a realistic expectation for you, for your level of leakage, but a high, high percentage of men are going to have either significant improvement in their symptoms or complete, complete cure of their incontinence. So big benefit here is that this, this offers men who have weakened sphincter or some type of damage, the ability to re-achieve continence. Okay. This, this mimics a normal sphincter and this allows patients to urinate when you want to. Okay. This is placed completely inside. So in that video, you wouldn't be able to know that that man had a urinary sphincter because it's all internal. Again, the satisfaction rate is very high. And this allows men to kind of restore some sense of normal. Okay. It's a new normal because you have to interact with your body in a different way to get the urine to pass, but it it's it's life changing. It really, it really is. Um, you know, so it, if you're bothered by your leakage, take action. You can do something about it. Okay. And most guys know this. Most guys are, you know, figuring things out and, and working around and trying to find ways to go back to what they were doing before. But you don't have to do it alone. Okay. There are so many men who deal with this problem and such a small percentage actually get it treated. Okay. You have control of that. You have the ability to change that. Speak to a urologist, keep track of what's going on with your body. Okay. Share your pad counts. Be honest. Okay. And be honest. There, there's like, there are five pads. There are three pads, two pads. You can have two pads that are completely sopping wet and have multiple liners inside them. Or you can have two pads that, you know, are a little bit moist. So be honest, keep a journal. It's hard to kind of just remember, especially because those guys are really trying not to think about the fact that they're leaking. Write it down for a little bit. That, that's really, really helpful for your prosthetic urologist to help make sure that we're picking the right treatment for you. Okay. Nothing's perfect. All of these things have risk. Okay. These are still surgeries. They're minor outpatient surgeries, but they're surgeries nonetheless. Okay, so the sling, biggest thing is it cannot work. Okay, if you have a high degree of leakage, even if you have a mild degree of leakage, you know, you have to get things perfect. And, and there's only so much that we can do. Sometimes the anatomy is just not right, and you put a sling in, and maybe you're worse afterwards. Okay, it's not common, but it can happen. Sometimes it can work too well. You know, you're, you're putting things in, you're putting in that support, but all of a sudden, are you actually just choking off the urethra for a little bit and having issues with not being able to empty your bladder? It usually doesn't last forever, okay? But it, hey, it can happen. It doesn't happen to most guys though. Again, I like the jock strap analogy because who's comfortable in a jock strap, right? So after you put in a sling, you can have a little bit of discomfort because this thing is supported or anchored on the inside of your thighs. So some men experience some discomfort related to that. You can have some irritation from the incisions. Those are really very minor. Foreign body response, again, extremely rare. This is material that's been used for surgery for years and years. Urinary sphincters, we gotta talk about it because it's not like you get one, you're, you're one and done, and you never need to have anything else done. Most guys, if you have it for long enough, look, this is a device, right? This has tubing, this has mechanical parts, this has a pump that you have to interact with. So it has parts, it has parts that can break down, that need maintenance, that need whatever. I can't do maintenance or troubleshooting or fixing on your sphincter without doing another surgery, okay? So you get one in, it might work, it might work great for you, but it stops working, you know, one of the parts busts, then you might need to have a revision surgery. And that's something that we do. Everybody who puts one in has to be comfortable with being able to go in and, and fix it every now and then. Erosions of the urethra are much, much less common. Okay, an erosion of the urethra means that the balloon cuff that's supposed to be hanging out on the 
still inside your body, but it's on the outside of your P tube. If that starts kind of eroding in, it can start becoming visible on the inside of your body. And that's no good. That can lead to infection. That's an issue. And in that, in most cases, the sphincter needs to be removed. It can be replaced later, but it's got to come out. Urinary retention is possible. It's usually transient, meaning it doesn't last forever. And uh, it's, it's also very rare. Okay. Infection, usually associated with erosion, usually associated with some amount of pain. Really, the infection rates are pretty low for this thing. It is designed in a very, very clever way. There's a reason why it was orange, or sorry, it was yellow on those diagrams. That's antibiotic coating. It's baked right into, into the device. So the infection rates have improved tremendously because of design and engineering and just not being satisfied with the fact that this thing has been on the market for 40 years in one way or the other. Okay, it's always getting better, and antibiotic coating is really one of those ways. Um, you know, these are just some quick hitters here. Insurance coverage, this and that, like, we're your doctors, right? I mean, we can, we can pick and recommend the right treatment for you, but the bottom line is it, it, it's got to work for you, right? It's for financially as well. So talk to your insurance company, figure out what the coverage is like. These things are, are generally covered, okay? Medicare and most private insurance companies cover male incontinence procedures, but check, right? You don't want to get surprised. And that's something that our offices do on a routine basis. Shout out to my vets, okay? You don't have to wait for a VA to get their act together to get treated, okay? If you're a vet, you can be eligible to receive care in the community. So a place like Chesapeake Urology or, or anywhere else who knows how to do a procedure like this, if for whatever reason, hey, maybe your VA doesn't even offer this type of surgery, you know, maybe they don't have any appointments within the next month, or you're 40 miles away, or you're, you know, taking a ferry to get on the other side of the to river, uh, the river to get to your VA facility, whatever it might be. If you can't get in the VA, you don't necessarily have to wait. There's a phone number here. There's a website. You can reach out and you can you can get treated in the community. So just to summarize here before we hop in and start taking some questions, male stress urinary incontinence, it's a known effect of prostate cancer treatment, okay? You didn't do anything wrong, all right? This is not, oh, I didn't do enough exercises or, oh, my surgeon did this or my surgeon did that. This happens, okay? This is a known side effect of prostate cancer treatment. You're a survivor, right? We got you through it, but you can be better and we can get you we can get you there there's a variety of treatment options they're not all surgical there are a lot of things that you can do it wasn't on the slide and most guys don't want to hear it but believe it or not weight loss is one of those things look at your height figure out what you're supposed to weigh and try to get there all right most most of the patients who i see they have some room for improvement there and if you lose weight believe it or not you might be shaving off pads a day, literally, pads a day with weight loss. There's studies to, to back that up. Coping, right, again, these are, these are short term, these are not really even fixes, these are figuring out how to get by. You can do that, maybe that's all you need, okay, and maybe you're happy with that. More power to you, that's awesome. You need tips, come and talk to one of us, all right? We are surgeons, but we're also your doctors, we're here to be your advocates, and make sure that you're able to get the treatment that fits for you. It's not like, oh, you're not getting surgery, see ya. It's, you have so many tools and options here available to you, just ask, right? A lot of guys have this problem, not a lot of guys ask. The sling or the sphincter are great options for certain men. All you have to do is talk to your prosthetic urologist, get an evaluation, come with a full bladder, and we'll figure it out, okay? Uh, some disclaimers here about the sling, about the sphincter, all of the resources that went into this. There are great educational materials that are available, uh, that are available through Boston Scientific, that are available from Chesapeake Urology, and that are available also through the Urology Care Foundation. So I'm going to suspend the, the slide portion of things now. And uh, James, maybe you can help me out here. I saw that we had some questions coming in over the course of the talk, and I'd love to yeah. take those this time. 
So I forgot to mention at the beginning, uh, if anybody has a question, you can click on that little chat icon at the bottom of your screen. All questions are anonymous. So you can type in a question and I'll see it and I will relay it to Dr. Sharma. Um, so the first question that I saw here was, what, what's the best way for them to get an appointment with you? And I'm, I'm wondering if maybe you put that slide back up on the screen of your name card with the phone number and just kind of talk them through what they should do to get in with you. Sure, yeah, so let's get that up here. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we have uh, we have a phone number that you can contact. Um, let's get this back up here. Three zero one nine three three nine six six zero. So pick up the phone, call or chesapeakeurology.com. Okay. I'm, I'm the provider in this area in Germantown in the really large parts of Montgomery County here, but I have colleagues all across our company who do this. So go to our website, find the provider that's closest for you and the best fit for you. And you know, that's what we're here for. We're happy to help. Most guys who have this problem do not go out and ask for help. We're here and, and this stuff works. Uh, so the next question I'm seeing here is um, if you, if I'm leaking a lot, would it be possible to try a sling first? That's a great question. And you know, that, that brings up a good talking point. There are actually surveys and studies that if, if I'm talking to a patient, just like, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a bunch of listeners here now, we talked about both, right? We talked about the sling, we talked about the sphincter. Everybody wants the sling. Literally everybody wants the sling. When you, when you offer both, something like 90% of guys are like, oh, I want the sling, right? That's, that's the sexy new thing that is like totally hands off, minimally invasive, it sounds great. Can you try it? That's a tough question, right? I mean, you have to have very, very realistic expectations about what's gonna happen. If you have a moderate to high amount of leakage, and you have the sling placed, it is not realistic to expect to be dry after that procedure. If your goal is to you know, be less incontinent, go from five pads to three pads or something like that, sure. You know, if you, it, has it ever happened that a guy has gotten like really a lot better after a sling, even if they have a moderate amount of incontinence? Sure, yeah. It's just a matter of, is that, is that a risk you're willing to take? Are you willing to go through you know, the, the hassle of an actual procedure, granted it's a minimally invasive procedure, knowing that it may or may not get you the results that you want? That's an individual, individual decision. Do we do it sometimes? Yeah, honestly, we do, okay? Is it the right choice for most men? Probably not. Uh, next question, I think you touched on this, but uh, will anyone know that I have um, specifically the AUS? I, I know the sling is uh, minimally invasive, but um, sure. the sphincter. Yeah, so really, unless somebody is paying very, very close attention to what you're doing at the urinal, no one is going to know that you have the AUS or the artificial urinary sphincter. Okay, It has three components. They're all internal components you go and manipulate the scrotum, but really if you were to just eyeball the scrotum, you wouldn't really see anything there. Now, now there are times where, you know, you can see the dimple of maybe the pump or the tubing, but you really have to look very closely and even partners in the bedroom, they're not gonna notice things like that in the vast majority of cases. So the next question here is, uh, gentleman has been uh, incontinent for five years after his prostatectomy. He's never heard about these surgical treatments and he's wondering why. Yeah, you know, that's a good question. And this is something that we as a field are trying to get better at because 
the the surgeon who took care of you and took care of your cancer is very very focused on getting you through that treatment right and chances are that they're very specialized and very good at what they do okay you don't want me doing your radical prostatectomy you want somebody who has done a number a number of prostate cancer surgeries, right? Somebody who can understand the nuance of when do I do nerve sparing, when do I not? How do I reconstruct this urethra or this bladder neck, okay? Those specialists typically, you know, they ask, but, but they may not always have the ability to offer these types of procedures. Because again, there's, there's prosthetic urologists who've had extra training in these types of surgeries. Now, that might be something institutionally that we're not doing a good job of, but you know, at, at Chesapeake Urology, we have a program designed especially for this, and, it, and it's called the Recovery Coach or the, or the Survivorship Program. So we team up with our surgeons, so up front, when you're getting the diagnosis of prostate cancer, you're hearing about these things, okay? You don't have to go into the details of slings and sphincters and all this stuff before you're even getting treatment. But it's important to know that these things exist. And it's important to know that there are doctors out there who can treat you purely from a quality of life perspective, focusing and giving the due diligence to you know, things like erectile function and urinary continence that are so important to survivors, right? Your first job was just getting through and getting cancer free. Now that you are, you know, you can use the resources that are available to you to, to get treated and get better. If you're five years out, there's no, oh, it's too late, okay? You might feel that way. The longer you live with either stress urinary incontinence or erectile dysfunction, the more disheartened, depressed, or down you can get about it, right? You kind of, I've seen this in a lot of guys, you know, they got treatment years ago. This, this is common with radiation because surgery, you know what the problem is right away, right? I mean, you're leaking right after surgery. It gets better or it doesn't. Usually it does, but with radiation, these things can kind of creep up. Maybe you get a scar tissue or something that, that blocks up the plumbing after radiation and you get a procedure to get that opened up and then all of a sudden you're leaking. So, so it can, it can happen in different ways for different people. You know, why is this the first time you've ever heard about it? I don't know, but is it too late to get treatment? Absolutely not. Uh, the next question is asking about um, medical literature references to the use of these devices in cases of incontinence other than prostate cancer surgery. So, so I know you mentioned, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So I believe the question is what other instances would these surgeries be appropriate? Like, is this only for men who are prostate cancer survivors who have had radical prostatectomies or can other men get a sling or a sphincter? Is that the question? Yeah, basically. And he mentions uh, if there's medical literature um, that speaks about it as well. Gotcha. So, you know, in general, the medical literature behind this, if we're getting into the weeds a little bit here, these are retrospective studies, okay? It's very hard to, to figure out what the best treatment is and how people do by setting up a study that says, hey, if you have leakage, come in and you might get this surgery or you might get that surgery, or you might get this or you might not get this. Okay? Those studies are really hard to do. So most of the information that we have is from years and years of experience and, and hundreds of patients at, at you know, big academic institutions, big teaching institutions that do a lot of these surgeries. It's very hard to get very good at these surgeries. You have to do a lot of them. And, and the information comes from these high-powered centers. So we do have information how, you know, for example, after radiation, what does the literature say about which one of these is best for a patient who's had radiation before? There is good medical literature that says you're going to be better off with an artificial urinary sphincter. And, and we can talk about why, right? In the sling, it's a hammock, it's something or a jock strap that's supposed to move 
your tissues around to recreate some degree of support. Well, years after radiation, or you know, even soon after radiation, those tissues are not the same. Right? Those tissues have gotten zapped, fried to a certain degree, collateral damage because they were close by to the area of the cancer. So those tissues are not as mobile. They're not going to respond to the sling the way that you know, tissues without radiation are going to respond. So there is, so there is some literature there. It's, it's few, it's far between, but it gives us guidance and it gives us information for special situations like that. Uh, next question is asking if uh, this does anything for erectile dysfunction. One more time. Does this, uh, do any of these um, treatments do anything for erectile dysfunction? They don't, no. So erectile dysfunction is common in men who have had prostate treatment, whether it be radiation, whether it be prostate removal, whether it be even TERPs can cause some erectile dysfunction. This is not going to positively or negatively affect your erections, okay? But this is often the first step. It's hard to focus on sex when you can't even get dry. So a lot of men, they notice, hey, maybe their sex drive is going up. Maybe their you know, relationships in the bedroom are a little bit more than they were before because they don't have to worry about leakage, okay? But if you need treatment for erectile dysfunction, all you have to do is ask, okay? You are still eligible for a penile prosthesis. You are still eligible for penile injection therapy or for pills or for any other number of treatments if you have had a sling or if you have had a sphincter. Uh, we have a question about um, the failure rate of the, 800, the AMS 800 and does it fail where urine cannot pass? So does it fail with retention? Okay. Retention rates after the artificial urinary sphincter tend to be a short period of time right after surgery. They are more common in a certain size of cuff. So these cuffs are custom fit to your anatomy. If you happen to need a cuff that is on the small end of the spectrum, those guys are at higher risk for retention. Okay. But as far as all comers, the retention rates are low. Okay, we're talking about less than 10%, less than 5% for retention rates. There was another part of that question. Uh, just the general failure rate of uh, the 800. Right, so uh, hard to know exactly what you mean by failure rates, but I'm gonna answer both. Okay, so failure rate may mean hey, it didn't work because I'm still leaking, okay? So all of the studies that we have define success a little bit differently. And if you ask your surgeon, or if you ask surgeons, did it work? You get a slightly different answer than if you ask patients, hey, did it work, right? So if you ask patients, did you have a significant amount of improvement or did you get dry? Then 80% or more say yes. Okay, so failure rate as far as, you know, still having an unsatisfying amount of leakage afterwards, maybe something in the 10 up to 20% range, that's not right away. That tends to be maybe a little bit over time because if you need a revision, it could, it could manifest by, hey, this used to work great for me, but somehow it, I feel like it's not quite doing it anymore. That can be related to a condition called urethral atrophy. So, so that might be considered a failure in your mind, but, but really that's just a normal part of having a sphincter. Now, if you're talking about mechanical failure rates, you know, those are a little bit all over the board, but again, I'd, I'd give you the same number, somewhere between five and 10% are gonna have a mechanical failure where like, hey, this thing is physically not working anymore. From a practical standpoint, I think what you wanna know is what is the chance that I'm gonna need another surgery after the first one? And the answer to that is really, it depends on how long you have the device, right? So, you know, if you get the implant and get hit by a car and drop dead a month later, then you're not gonna need another surgery. But if you have it for five years, 10 years, 15 years, you take all comers and the revision rate is about one in four. Okay, so you can think about it in that way. You know, one in four chance I'm gonna need another surgery. Typically those happen within the first couple of years actually. Um, but after that, it's just a matter of, 
the longer you have it, the more likely you're gonna you're gonna need a tune up for it. So uh, I always recommend that men go in with the mindset for the for the urinary sphincter that hey, I'm getting this put in. I may very well need some something for this down the line. So we're running low on time. Um, I wanted to. I have one more question, but before I ask that, I wanted to mention that we do have um, patient advocates, patient champions who um, have had these surgeries uh, that are willing to talk either via email or phone or FaceTime, however you'd like to speak with them. Uh, and that the email in your um, invite, Sarah Goins, if you wanted to reach out to her, we could get you online with them. Dr. Sharma also has access to um, a large number of patient advocates as well. So. Anyone who's wondering about the experience of a patient, we can set that up, uh, no problem. That, that's an awesome resource, okay, right? Because you want to hear about it from someone who's actually had one, right? I can explain to you my end of things, how it goes in, how I pick patients, how they do, and this and that. I'm not living this. I don't, you know, I don't have one of these. You want to talk to someone who does. And then I think uh, the last question we'll have time for is, uh, what is the life cycle of the sling? You know, that's a good question. We've been putting these in for, you know, probably about 10 years or so. We don't really think of it as a life cycle. So the way this thing works is it's, it's a piece of mesh and it's not necessarily the mesh that's doing the work. The mesh is kind of a lattice, a framework, a structure. But like all meshes, like the meshes that are done for hernia repairs or the meshes that are done for, for prolapse or anything like that, the mesh is a network that allows your body to kind of scar in and build tissue and support around it. So once it's in, it's in. Well, thank you so much again for your time, Dr. Sharma. Thank you all for joining. Uh, once again, please call the number on your screen there if you'd like to make an appointment with Dr. Sharma. Uh, and please, uh, thanks again. Have a great night.